ages, toddlers, nursery age, all the way up to uh, uh, 12 years of age. And while all these beautiful children are making their way back, I'm going to ask that you take your Bibles and turn to the second chapter in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, and today our text will come from the first four verses. I also want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to find the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17. And today we're going to use some verses there to reinforce and better understand the truths that we're looking at here in our text uh, this morning. Now it's always important to keep in mind what we've learned up to this point here in our study in the book of Hebrews. Uh, first, we saw there in the first three verses of chapter 1 that Jesus is better than the prophets. Remember, that's the theme of the book, that Jesus is better than it all. Better than anyone or anything in the universe. And there in the first three verses, we saw that He's better than the prophets. That God's final revelation to mankind as spoken through the person of Jesus Christ is better than God's first revelations to mankind as spoken through the prophets. And then last week, beginning in verse 4 of chapter 1, the writer began to show us that Jesus is better than the angels. And this section of Scripture that proves that Jesus is better than the angels runs from the fourth verse there in chapter 1 all the way to the end of chapter 2. But here in the midst of this great discourse, the writer pauses. And he pauses to extend an invitation to the people. See, we need to understand today, church, that the gospel message requires a response. It requires an action on our behalf. And here within the text, the writer warns us of what happens when we fail to make the appropriate response, when we fail to take the appropriate action. This is a warning. I told you in the introductory sermon to this series that here in the book of Hebrews, from time to time, the writer will pause from his line of thought and issue a warning to unbelievers. And that is what we have before us this morning. It's a warning and an invitation to come. The writer warns us today not to be careless with Christ. Don't be careless with Christ. So we're going to look at this warning here within our text, and then we're going to use the 17th chapter of the book of Acts to, to better understand, I think, what the Holy Spirit would have us to see this morning. So with that in mind, let's read here in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We're told, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will." May God bless the reading of His Word here this morning. Now to begin with, I want you to notice what we're told there in verse number 1. We're told, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Now let's stop right there for just a moment. First, notice that the verse begins with the word, therefore. Now any time in Scripture when you're studying the Bible, any time you see the word, therefore, you need to figure out why it's therefore. This word is always pointing us back to previous verses. And in this case, the word is pointing us back to chapter 1 and all the truths that we saw. Remember, we learned that Jesus is the heir of all things. That He is the creator and sustainer of the universe. He is the exact imprint of the invisible God. He is the one who, who purged our sins and is now seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. We learned that because of His obedience, that He was given a name which is above every name. Jesus is righteous. He is eternal. He's worthy of our worship. He is God. Therefore, because of who Jesus is, we're told in verse 1 that we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard. 
Here the writer tells us that because of who Jesus is, we ought to pay very close attention to the gospel message. The gospel message this morning demands to be treated with the utmost seriousness. And it demands that because eternal issues are at stake. Now all of us here have heard the gospel message many, many times. Perhaps most of us have heard it our entire lives, but I want us to listen to it again here in the book of Acts. This is Paul speaking at Mars Hill. And he reiterates many of the truths that we've learned over the last couple of weeks. But then he takes it a step further by relaying to us what is demanded from God. Listen to what we're told in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 22. We're told, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions, and I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him I declare unto you. So Paul's going through Mars Hill. He sees all of these statues, and one is to the unknown God. And Paul says, I'm going to preach and let you know who this unknown God is. And he says, God, that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they may, feel, they may feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. Paul says, God has winked at your ignorance. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day. This is why we need to repent. He has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. Here Paul says, what God is requiring of you is to repent and to believe. We are to turn away from our sin and put our faith in Jesus Christ. This is the gospel message that we've all heard. This is the message that the writer of Hebrews says we need to pay very close attention to. And we're told here in verse 1 of our text that we need to pay very close attention to the gospel unless at any time we would let it slip. Now that word slip literally means to drift away. To drift away. Now understand this morning, church, the gospel message doesn't drift from us as the King James implies here. Okay? It doesn't drift from us. The gospel message, the word of God, isn't going anywhere. Okay? It's eternal. Just like the souls of men and God Himself, the Word of God is eternal. We're told in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, and the flower fades, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. Jesus Himself reiterates that truth in the Olivet Discourse. He says in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. We're also told in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Are you starting to get the picture? The word of God is sure and steadfast. It's, it's not going anywhere, much less just drift away. The harbor of salvation is eternally secure this morning. The problem is man is not. Man is not. So many are drifting along the stream of life. And the gospel, uh, the gospel message is being declared from the bank side. It's being declared and declared. And the harbor of salvation can be accessed at any moment. Yet, so many just drift right by it. Just drift right by it. And once they drift by the harbor of salvation, it's gone forever. Forever. 
That's the warning here. That's what the Spirit is saying here. You need to pay close attention to what you've heard. Don't drift by the Word that is being preached to you. Don't drift by the harbor of salvation. I know we've got many people here that like to spend time on the river, out in nature. You enjoy doing things like tubing and rafting and canoeing and kayaking. Let me ask you this. What does it take to drift in the current? What is required of you to just drift along in the current? Nothing. Requires nothing for you just to drift along. It requires nothing for you just to drift right by something. And that's all it takes to drift by the harbor of salvation. All you have to do is do nothing. Do nothing. And let me show you what that looks like here this morning. In Paul's message to the people there on Mars Hill, we're told that God commanded all men everywhere to repent. And not only to turn from your sin, but to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what God requires out of man. But listen to how some chose to respond to what they heard. We're told in Acts chapter 17, verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear thee again on this manner. The gospel message had been declared, yet they didn't pay close enough attention to what they heard. And as a result, they drifted right by salvation. Drifted right by it. And these same two groups of drifters exist today. There are some among us this morning. Some of you today are mocking God. And you may not be mocking God publicly or outwardly, but you're mocking God in your heart. Thinking to yourself, well, how naive does someone have to be to believe the, the gospel message? How naive do you have to be to believe that the Bible is true? How naive do you have to be, believe to, or be to believe that God would come to the earth, die on the cross for our sins, and be resurrected on the third day? How naive? How childish is that? For others today, you're not mocking God this morning. You're just not going to make a decision. At least not today. Like that group at Mars Hill, you say to yourself, I'll listen again next week. And then next week comes, you say, well, I'll listen again next week. And before you know it, years pass. And you've never done what God requires of you. Repent and believe. Two groups of people today that did nothing, and as a result, they drifted right by salvation when it was there all along for the taking. It was there. And notice the consequences this morning of doing nothing. Notice the consequences of being careless with Jesus Christ. We're told in verses 2 and 3 that since the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now this word spoken by angels that is referenced here in verse 2 is apparently a reference to the Ten Commandments. As we all know, the Lord was present and active in, in giving Moses the, the law, the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. But the Bible tells us that the angels were also there. And they were instrumental in bringing the Ten Commandments to the nation of Israel and all of humanity. And Moses himself testifies to that truth. He testifies to the fact that there were thousands of angels with him and the Lord there high upon the mountain. Listen to what we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 33 beginning in verse 1. This is Moses' last address to the people. He's getting ready to die. And we're told, and this is the blessing, wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Sair unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints, ten thousands of angels. From his right hand went the fiery law, the Ten Commandments, for them. Thousands of angels accompanied the Lord as He descended there upon the mountain. We're also told in Psalm 68, verse 17, that the chariots of God are twenty thousands, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. 
So angels were present and active in issuing the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know exactly what role they played, but Scripture tells us they were there, and obviously they were speaking. And here we're told in the book of Hebrews that the word which they spoke was steadfast, unmovable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. The Ten Commandments today cannot be altered. I know that many are trying to do away with them. Many pastors no longer recognize them. But that is God's moral law. It never changes. This is what God expects from mankind. And under the Old Testament, when you broke the Ten Commandments, when you broke the law, the law broke you. There was no way out. If you committed adultery, or worshipped a false god, or blasphemed the Lord, you were killed immediately. You were stoned to death. That was the punishment. That was the penalty for being disobedient to God. And the writer of Hebrews says here in verse 3, if that was the penalty for being disobedient during the Old Testament, how shall we escape if we are disobedient to what God is asking us to do under the New Testament? How shall we escape if we reject Jesus Christ? Under the Old Testament, God gave us His Ten Commandments. But under the New Testament, God gave us His beloved Son. How shall we escape this morning if we fail to repent of our sin and put our faith in Him? There is no escape. There is no escape. If you carelessly drift by Jesus Christ and the harbor of salvation, there is no escape from what's to come. Don't be careless with Christ this morning. That's the whole premise of today's lesson. Don't be careless. All you have to do to go to hell is do nothing. That's all you have to do. Just drift along this life and do nothing when it comes to Jesus. That's all it takes. Some of you may be thinking, well, I want to believe. I want to believe. But but how do I know that, that this is the right way? There's so many religions. How do I know? How do I know that the gospel message is true, that it hadn't been tainted by men? How do I know that it's trustworthy? Well, it's trustworthy this morning for three reasons. First, notice that it's trustworthy because it was spoken by the Lord. We're told in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord. Keep in mind who spoke the good news of the gospel first. It was the Lord. The gospel message was spoken by the creator and sustainer of the universe. It was spoken by the one who is upholding all things by the word of His power. It was spoken by the one who, who purged our sins and is now seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. It was spoken by the one who eternally loves righteousness and hates iniquity. It was spoken by the one who never changes. It was spoken by God. And for that reason, it can be trusted today, church. The gospel can be trusted. Secondly, it can be trusted because it was confirmed by those who heard him speak. We're told at the end of verse 3 that his words were confirmed unto us by them that heard him. The apostles heard the word of God. They heard the words of Jesus and confirmed those words by putting it to paper. The word of the Lord was confirmed by what we have in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That confirmed it. Okay? And finally this morning, the Gospel message can be trusted because it has been certified by God. We're told in verse 4 that God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. As we study the Bible, as we read the Gospels, we look at all these amazing miracles that Jesus performed. And what we need to understand today is that the primary purpose of these miracles was not to alleviate distress and not to alleviate suffering. No, the primary purpose of these miracles was to validate who Jesus was to validate His message, to prove that He spoke on behalf of God. We all remember the story of Nicodemus. Listen again to what he says in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This is one of the 50 smartest men in all of Israel. One of the chief priests sat on the Sanhedrin, the court, 
We're told there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. He came to, to Jesus under the cover of darkness and said unto him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Nicodemus knew that no man could do the miracles that Jesus performed except God be with him. The miracle certified who Jesus was and, and what Nicodemus failed to realize that this was God that was performing the miracles. God in human flesh. So I stand before you today proclaiming that the gospel message can be trusted. It can be trusted. I know we live in a skeptical society. We're taught not to trust anything. But what we have in the Bible is truth. It's the truth. It can be trusted. So the question before us today is, what do you need to do this morning to ensure that you don't carelessly drift by salvation and eternal life? What must you do? The answer is you must tie yourself to Christ. You must tie off to Christ. As we've already seen, there were two groups of people who failed to respond to the gospel there on Mars Hill. There were the mockers. And then there were those who wanted to, to wait one more week or, or one more day before they responded and made a decision. Two groups of people who drifted right by salvation. Drifted right by. But there was a third group that day. And this third group tied themselves to Christ. Listen again to what we're told in Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 30. We're told in the times of this ignorance, God winked at. God's winking at your ignorance. Okay? But now commands all men everywhere to repent. That's God's commandment. Okay? To turn from your sin. To turn from your lifestyle. Why? Because He has appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness. Remember what we learned last week? That Jesus reigns with a rod of righteousness. He loves righteousness and hates iniquity. He will judge with righteousness by that man who He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men. How do you know judgment's coming? Because of the resurrection from the dead. Because God raised Jesus from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again, on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto Christ and believed. That right there is what it takes. Right there. You've got to secure your life to Jesus Christ. You've got to tie off to Him. You've got to get out of the current. Quit drifting alone. And tie yourself to Jesus. If not, this morning, I'm here to warn you. If you don't do it, you're going to carelessly drift by the harbor of salvation and drift into eternity. Lost forever. Lost forever. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we just pray that you just take control of the room. Lord, in a group this size, Lord, we know that there's those who are mocking in their hearts. We know that there's those who, who want to make a decision, just not today. Just not today. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'll open their eyes to what is to come if they don't make that decision. If they don't do what you're asking of them. Lord, it's so simple a child can understand it, Lord. Just repent, just turn from our sin and put our faith in you to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that there not be one under the sound of my voice that carelessly drifts by salvation into eternity without you. Lord, this is a warning, but it's also an invitation, Lord, for the people to come. Lord, not to put off decisions any longer, Lord. Whatever you've been laying on people's hearts, Lord, today is the day of salvation. Perhaps today is the day that people need to rededicate their lives. Lord, we must be attentive and pay very close attention to the things that we're hearing. Lord, these are your words. Lord, I pray that you'd prick our hearts.
Lord, I just, I just ask that you just speak this morning, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask that we stand this morning. We're going to have a song of invitation. This is what...